In the 1950s, a weapon was invented that has become more powerful than America's deadliest weapons of mass destruction. It is the weapon of mass deception, and it is right in our own living rooms. The hypnotizing world of picture television brings us the news of the world through two central news agencies called Reuters and the Associated Press. The Rothschilds bought Reuters in the 1800s, which later bought the Associated Press and made the Rothschild family owners of the world's largest central news services. To the present day, the world depends on these Rothschild-owned central news services as their main source of news and information. In his book called Who Owns the TV Networks, author Eustace Mullins claims that the major TV networks, radio stations, newspapers, and publishing empires are controlled by the Rothschild, Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan money cartels through their corporate conglomerates. The bankster-owned media conglomerates include weapons manufacturers General Electric and Westinghouse, which profit from promoting wars. Their man in Washington is head of the FCC Federal Communications Commission, and his name is Michael Powell, the son of Colin Powell. Michael Powell was put in charge of changes to the media monopoly rules and who can own what. Joining public opposition to Michael Powell's FCC deregulation policies, Senator Byron Dorgan had this to say. Seldom have I seen a regulatory agency cave in so completely to the big economic interests. That's exactly what happened today with the FCC rules. And Chairman Powell kept suggesting slight modifications. It's not slight at all. These are, this is a big deal. It's going to affect what the American people can see, can hear, can read. And let me emphasize something that was in your setup piece. After what the FCC did today, it is likely, in fact, that in big American cities, we will see the same company own the newspaper, three television stations, eight radio stations, and the cable system in that city, all under one company. And I don't know what happened to this notion of competition, but I'm telling you, it's not there, and it's not embedded anywhere in the FCC's decision. Well, I'm just going to have to say that, that there are a lot of lies being told. In his new book, Brock says the key to the success of the right-wing media is opinion, predicated on a raft of distortions, misrepresentations, and outright lies presented to the readers and viewers as fact. I think it used to be... Control over the internet, publishing, recording, and top cable companies can be traced back to the same big five media empires, General Electric, Time Warner, Viacom, Disney, and News Corp. These media monopolies are owned directly or indirectly by the Rothschild, J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, and Oppenheimer Brotherhood. Yes, there are now more stations and more media voices, but they're all coming from the same ventriloquist, says Senator Dorgan. show needs corporate sponsors and corporate sponsors sponsor pro-business pro-government programming and journalists who support the agenda of the big five media owners while two-thirds of the world goes hungry these banksters offer gazillion dollar sponsorships to sports athletes to play with their balls why because they keep the masses distracted from the important issues like the passage of the Patriot Act to limit your civil rights and freedoms the Patriot Act allows the government to come into your home, take things from your home, search your home, and never tell you about it. Increasingly, however, Americans are speaking out. The media and banking monopolists now have the power to make or break political leaders around the globe. Why haven't the networks made a TV movie of the week about how the Bush family made their family fortune? The movie could be called The Awful Truth, starring George W.'s great-grandfather, Samuel P. Bush whose Buckeye Steel Castings Company supplies parts for Edward Harriman's railroads, who in turn provides rail shipments for John D. Rockefeller Standard Oil, who in turn gets monopoly financing from the Rothschilds. The movie could be made into a TV series starring Samuel's son, Prescott Bush, as the managing director of a Nazi steel manufacturing plant in Poland called Silesian Consolidated Steel. In episode one, Prescott Bush forwards American financing to his German partner, Fritz Tyson, through the Union Banking Corporation in New York. 
Fritz Tyson arranges a contract with Nazi Germany's IG Farben Company for free Jewish slave labor in Bush's steel manufacturing plant at the Auschwitz concentration camp. Episode 2 shows Skull and Bonesman Prescott Bush and Avril Harriman getting caught under Trading with the Enemy Act as the U.S. government moves in and seizes all of their shares in Union Banking Corporation. In episode three, Prescott's son, the first George Bush, is director of the CIA. George puts drug king Manuel Noriega on the CIA payroll allowing thousands of tons of cocaine to hit the streets of America via the Panama Canal. In episode four, George's son, the second George Bush, becomes partners with Osama bin Laden's older brother, Salem bin Laden, in a Texas oil company called Arbusto Energy. Episode five introduces George W. Shady younger brother, Neil Bush, ripping off the elderly in the Silverado savings and loan scandal that cost U.S. taxpayers $1.3 billion. In episode six, the Florida election is fixed by George W.'s older brother, Jeb Bush, who puts brother George into the top job at the White House, which brings us back to Auschwitz and the concluding episode with George W. Bush visiting the slave labor camp where his grandfather helped build the Bush family fortune on free Jewish slave labor. Besides our sobering reminder that of the power of evil and the need for people to resist evil. Ladies and gentlemen, as a follow-up to the TV series, an award show could celebrate the 20-year friendship of the Bush and Bin Laden families and their shared investment in the Carlyle Group. The Carlyle Group is one of America's largest weapons contractors. For the Bush and Bin Laden families, war means profits, big profits. Although the media creates the illusion of freedom of the press, the dominant opinion and messages always serve the bankster's agenda. Messages like, support your troops or you're a traitor to America. But who are the troops? Many are teenagers whose childhood entertainment was shooting out the blood and guts of virtual people in places that are virtually real. Now they're blowing up real people in places that are really real, like schools, hospitals, and villages filled with families and children. Burns, open wounds, amputations, spinal cord injuries, broken bones, eyes that have been sprayed with shrapnel, the list is long and predictable. The chilling reality is that up to 15% of the tax money deducted from your paycheck each month buys the bombs and pays the salaries of troops to commit these atrocities. Rivers of blood from innocent families and their children is on everybody's hands. The plan for world domination by the banksters cannot be accomplished without your cooperation. That plan was formulated in 1773 at Mayor Rothschild's goldsmith shop by 13 influential German Jewish families. Among them were Rothschild, Oppenheimer, Warburg, and Schiff. Their formula for global control is the 3M formula, money control, media control, and military control. New one. Mark. Like changes to the rules that gave these families the media and money monopolies, new laws are being passed to transfer military control to them by privatizing the military. But if they're killing terrorists, who cares if they are government soldiers or corporate soldiers? A more important question to ask is, who exactly are the terrorists and where do terrorists get their training? The answer is right smack in America at Fort Benning, Georgia. Until January 2001, America's terrorist training school was called School of the Americas. But because of massive protests against its activities, the name was changed to WISC, 
Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation. Actress Susan Sarandon narrated a documentary film called School of the Assassins. The film exposes the school as a terrorist training camp whose graduates are well-known murderers, torturers, state terrorists, and dictators, including drug king Manuel Noriega. The role of terrorists in the bankster-owned media is to scare the living tax dollars out of citizens, and timing is everything. On the second anniversary of the 911 attack on the World Trade Center, George Bush asked for an $87 billion increase in military spending. At the same time, the media released a dramatic video showing Osama bin Laden alive and well and threatening to make the 911 attack seem like foreplay. How much do we really know about America's favorite villain? Multimillionaire Osama bin Laden was the 17th of 52 children fathered by a wealthy construction baron named Mohammed bin Laden, who had close ties to the Saudi royal family and the Bush family. In 1979, the American CIA and Pakistan's ISI financed an anti-Soviet group in Afghanistan and provoked a profitable 10-year war with the Russians. When the Russians invaded Afghanistan, the CIA hired Osama bin Laden to recruit and train Al-Qaeda fighters to fight the Russian army. Invasion. The anti-communist guerrillas in Afghanistan have been at the front line to fight against the threat of communism. But what was the fight really all about? Not carrots or potatoes. It was about poppies endless fields of opium poppies that provide over 70 percent of the world's heroin supply to heroin addicts worldwide. These are very uncomfortable issues for politicians. It was a dramatic story, but the media failed to tell us the less heroic side of Afghanistan's freedom fighters. America's new friends had become hooked on the economics of the poppy. During the war, many of the Mujahideen radically increased the production of opium, the raw ingredient of heroin. The international drug trade began in 1606 when Queen Elizabeth I built England's wealth by trafficking illegal opium from India to China. British East India Shipping Company and profited handsomely, not just from drug trafficking, but from trafficking African slaves with her slave trader, John Hawkins. Elizabeth I knighted her slave trader with the noble title of Sir John Hawkins. By 1830, the British had distanced themselves from dope dealing by granting opium monopoly rights to the Jewish Sassoon family, who became known as the Rothschilds of the Far East. As an agent for the Crown, David Sassoon shared his dope profits with Queen Victoria. The British East India Company built a major factory to process the opium here at Ghazapur. It's still a lucrative earner for the Indian government, which sells opiates to the world's pharmaceutical industry. When the Chinese banned opium and destroyed 600 chest loads of the addictive drug, Sassoon and the British retaliated. It was a financial disaster for the British. With huge profits at stake, they retaliated with the Opium Wars of 1843 and 1858. The forces of the market were to defeat China's moral prohibition. Sassoon and the British forced drug addiction onto an entire nation, stole the island of Hong Kong, and made Hong Kong the capital of the British international drug trade. In 1872, 
Queen Victoria knighted David Sassoon's son, Albert Sassoon, who spread the illegal opium trade throughout China and Japan. In 1887, Sir Albert Sassoon married Aline Carolyn Rothschild and joined the pirated fortunes of the Sassoon drug cartel with the Rothschild money cartel. Today, it's business as usual for the descendants of the Sassoon and Rothschild families who socialize with Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Charles as elite members of Britain's inner power circle. Many have been granted royal titles, like Sir, Countess, Baron, and Marquis, but their many victims aren't fooled by the crowns, the titles, and the tuxedos. They have very different titles for them. Titles like liars, thieves, dope dealers, and mass murderers for the crown. On the other side of the Atlantic, a member of the same opium smuggling syndicate, Samuel Russell, founded Yale University's Skull and Bones Brotherhood with drug money. Exclusive members were financed into political power positions in the CIA, the U.S. Supreme Court, and the White House. When Skull and Bonesman George Bush Sr. became CIA director in the 1980s, the CIA recruited Osama bin Laden to train al-Qaeda and Mujahideen fighters in Afghanistan. The job of Osama's trainees was not just to fight the Russian communists, it was to run Afghanistan's multi-billion dollar opium trade. Heroin, manufactured from Afghan opium, supplied 250 to 300 billion dollars annually to Wall Street and the U.S. banks. Authors Alfred McCoy and Michael Levine tied the CIA to this unholy drug alliance and received national attention when the CIA tried to suppress their books. Michael Levine became a best-selling author when he wrote about his experience of this unholy alliance. After 30 years distinguished service with the DEA, he could write with some authority. You could look at what they did to me in, uh, as a, uh, an example in microcosm of Central Intelligence's actions in the State Department in uh, completely subverting the drug war. You know, the drug war was something that only existed in the minds of Americans, on the streets of America, for kids like my brother, for cops who died. There, there was no drug war. The biggest drug dealers in the world were given a license to sell drugs to Americans to support themselves. And this continued right down from Southeast Asia, through the Mujahideen, through the Contras. But how was the heroin smuggled into the United States? One of America's most gruesome secrets is that during the Vietnam War, heroin was smuggled into the United States by hiding it inside the body bags of dead American soldiers. By the end of the 1960s, one-third of U.S. soldiers in Vietnam and close to one million United States citizens were hooked on heroin. Drugs like LSD, mescaline, marijuana, and hashish also swamped the streets and college campuses of America. Who or what turned America's youth onto these illegal drugs? Celebrity anti-war activists like Aldous Huxley, Timothy Leary, Allen Ginsberg, and Bertrand Russell sold America's youth on acid rock, tripping out, and one world government. Their financing came from the Warburg Banksters and IPS, Institute for Policy Studies. Over 100 million doses of LSD that hit the streets of America were purchased by Timothy Leary and Alan Dulles through S.G. Warburg's Sandoz AB Pharmaceutical Company in Switzerland. Free sample size packages of acid were handed out not only on college campuses, but at rock concerts where musicians persuaded millions of fans to get high. I got the body there. 
the drug culture blame parents, teachers, law enforcement, and everybody except the people behind it all, namely the Rothschild Warburg Banksters and their committee of 300. According to Dr. John Coleman, who wrote the story of the committee of 300, the Beatles rock group were brought to America by the Tavistock Institute. Tavistock launched the drug culture revolution in America to popularize and normalize social drug use. Through their record companies and advertising monopolies, the banksters have packaged and financed their celebrity salesmen to anesthetize, addict, and enslave billions of people worldwide with dependencies on both prescription and non-prescription, legal and illegal drugs. Those drugs range from alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine to Prozac, crack cocaine, and heroin. Like the phony war on terrorism, the phony war on drugs is a cat and mouse game being fought with one hand and fed with the other. The peace symbol adopted by the drug flower children of the 60s was designed by Gerald Holtham, who was commissioned by One World Government salesman Bertrand Russell. The symbol was never designed as a symbol of peace, but as a symbol of death. It is actually a cross turned upside down with the arms broken and is used by Satanists and in Druid witchcraft. In Germany, the symbol is known as the death rune and is found on tombstones of Hitler's Nazi SS officers. CIA's team of ex-Nazis and Skull and Bonesmen financed and trained Osama bin Laden, who pushed the Russians out of Afghanistan by 1989. The CIA then trained and installed the ruthless Taliban regime to run the booming opium trade. After a decade, the long friendship between America and the Taliban suddenly turned ugly. At a meeting held on December 4, 1997 at Unical headquarters, American oil men made a proposal to the Taliban about building a pipeline through Afghanistan. Rothschild Shell Oil and Rockefeller's Exxon Oil had invested billions in the Kazakhstan oil and gas reserves just north of Afghanistan. Now they needed a pipeline to transport it to the Persian Gulf. The Taliban demanded a bigger cut and turned down the proposal. Suddenly, the banksters' American-controlled media were calling the Taliban monsters, evildoers, and cruel villains who beat up on women. On July 4th, 1999, President Clinton froze the Taliban's U.S. assets and bank accounts and imposed trade sanctions on Afghanistan. By February 2001, the Taliban destroyed most of Afghanistan's opium crops. In May, Secretary of State Colin Powell announced a gift of 43 million U.S. taxpayers' dollars to the Taliban. He called it a reward to the Taliban for destroying the opium crops, but members of the new George W. Bush White House knew the Taliban would use the 43 million for more sinister purposes. The larger issue is uh, not just not connecting the dots, but not getting the dots. Why was it that CIA was unable to collect information for years uh, inside Afghanistan. When they had authority to kill bin Laden for over two and a half years, why were they unable to kill him or his lieutenants? Why didn't they have a better capability to do something about it at the source? Could it be that the bankster-supported U.S. administration is controlling both sides of the war on terror? <laughs> Before the first plane ever even hit the first tower on 911, a massive U.S., British, and NATO troop buildup was already organized and positioned for an attack on Israel's enemies, opium-rich Afghanistan and oil-rich Iraq. And uh, uh, there's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, Wanted, Dead or Alive. With no solid proof 
of who was responsible for 911, George Bush Jr. attacked the poverty-stricken, war-ravaged country of Afghanistan only four weeks after 911. The U.S. and British military dropped 12,000 bombs on thousands of buildings and homes, pounding them into dust and rubble and killing 8,000 Afghan people. 20,000 more people died from war-related cold, starvation, and disease. Nobody made a big-budget TV production out of the massacre with a God Bless Afghanistan movie score. The U.S.-British war on Afghanistan left behind millions of starving people and thousands of women who are still veiled, still homeless, and still penniless. Afghanistan is the world's largest producer of opium and now the world's largest producer of heroin. There can never be peace and democracy in Afghanistan. Why? Because peace and democracy would expose and cut off corporate America's opium and heroin trade at the source. So what was the payoff for the U.S.-British war on Afghanistan? One, the uncooperative Taliban warlords got kicked out and replaced by the cooperative Northern Alliance warlords. Two, opium and heroin production and revenues skyrocketed. Three, Afghanistan got a new leader named Hamid Karzai, who just happens to be an ex-employee of Unical Oil. Three, America got permission to build their oil and gas pipeline through Afghanistan. And four, the Bush administration's favorite excuse for war, Osama bin Laden, was allowed to escape. America's second